Hello, hi, and a warm welcome to the Samadhi Podcast, a series of short talks and guided meditations that help you become a happier, more peaceful, and positive person. Learn how to calm the mind, deeply relax, gain control of feelings and emotions, and let go of stress and anxiety. I am thrilled to welcome Neil Seligman to the podcast this week. Neil is an international speaker and expert in mindfulness, resilience, conscious leadership, and corporate well-being. He's the founder of The Conscious Professional and author of several books, including Conscious Leadership and 100 Mindfulness Meditations. I've asked Neil to come onto the podcast today to talk about his journey and his own experience with mindfulness and to discuss a little bit about unconscious versus conscious living. Hi, Neil. Welcome. Hi, David. Really nice to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, of course, there's a a bit of an introduction there to you, but I'd love if you could start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey into, you know, how you ended up becoming a mindfulness expert. Yeah, um, it's a slightly long story, so I'll I'll try and abridge it a little bit. But if if you want more detail, just ask. So um, I guess I started um, as a teenager with an interest in meditation um, and also yoga, the sort of two went hand in hand for me um, at the beginning. Um, and I, I'm not quite sure why I was interested, um, because nobody in my family had an interest in you know, that side of life, really. Um, but I ended up saving up my pocket money and buying a book, How to, how to Meditate and Teach Yourself Yoga, um, and just started, started sort of practicing as best as I could from the book. Um, and then I went to, um, the States after school. So I just kind of finished, um, senior school and went to America to a kid's camp to work out there as a, first of all, as a tennis coach, and then as a sort of a general counselor for the kids. And there I met a Reiki master, um, and Reiki is that kind of healing modality, um, which you might've come across. It's kind of, you know, sometimes made a bit spas and things like that. And, um, yeah, it's um, it's a really nice energy technique, um, which people find relaxing and calming and sometimes has kind of healing effects for people. And I ended up learning Reiki from this Australian guy out in America. Um, and that kind of really blew my mind and, and opened me up to this sort of different dimension of life, which just made a lot of sense to me because, um, I don't know, it just felt like as I was going through school that there was like something they were telling us about. Like I was sort of yeah. thinking the world seemed to work in a slightly different way than the sort of parameters that I was being taught. And then Reiki came along and I was like, oh, this is like the missing piece. The energy piece is like part of it. Um, and so even though I didn't really know it, as I was learning Reiki, I was learning the skills of mindful embodiment and meditation because Reiki's taught with those kind of principles and through those experiential aspects. Um, and um, so, you know, when the education spat me out at the other end with a law degree um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, a bit of a push from my parents towards um, becoming a barrister and going to bar school and things like that, um, I was also by that time a, a used to be Reiki master. Um, and, and for a little while there, I was pursuing these two quite different paths simultaneously. Um, so, so yeah, so I was a a barrister in London, um, with a little business on the side called the holistic life practice, uh, where I was was seeing people, um, you know, in the evenings and weekends and doing healings and, that just started opening up and and people would come to me for meditation tuition um, and then for kind of coaching. And um, it just sort of unfolded quite naturally. Um, But it was a bit of a bit of a kind of hard thing for me to stand in the middle of those two different lines. It was almost different aspects of me that were going into those two professions. and then, yeah, at a certain point in my legal career, I was about eight years into practice when um, I had I had quite a profound spiritual insight in the car park <laughs> um, <laughs> when a friend of mine um, who I hadn't seen for a while, we'd gone to bar school together, 
he came up to me um, and said, hey, Neil, um, haven't seen you for ages. I hear you're one of the rising stars of the civil bar. Um, and no one had ever said that to me before. But what I heard in my head when he said that was, your star is rising in the wrong field. You have to leave. <laughs> so um, that insight felt so true in my body and being that mm. um, I did. <laughs> It uh, wrapped up my law career um, and took about five months. And then I, I, I left not really knowing what was going to be next for me. Um, and I was quite lucky that I'd met a few months before then um, a meditation teacher who um, I still am a student of hers. And uh, so that's been about 14 years or something like that. Um, and um, I'd met her and she helped me use my i suppose thirst for spiritual inquiry to also um almost let everything go and then rebuild from this internal place of listening to that which was seeking to emerge through me in my life um and even though that's a very slow process and not a sort <laughs> of good quick fix type, it doesn't make for a good book of uh, do this one thing and your life will be solved. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. It was like a really profound process, but as a lived experience, it was, you know, it felt quite slow and um, organic and, you know, those are good things, but it, you know, it was also a challenge along the way of like, what am I doing? What have I done? Yeah. I bet. Going. <laughs> Um, and then in 2012, like the idea for the conscious professional, which is my business landed in a meditation. Um, and I sort of had the, um, insight that it was going to be centered around mindfulness. And that was really clear. Although I did question it because nobody had heard of mindfulness in 2012. <laughs> uh, so that, that just started a sort of new slow journey <laughs> into, into my current work so yeah that's you know it's quite a long time ago now it's, um almost 10 years that even that landed so yeah here we are yeah so it, it, it sounds like i mean the idea for the contra professional came to you in a meditation so it, it seemed like you're probably quite confident of where it was coming from um but that sort of decision or, or that feeling in the car park must have been quite um a weird one you know sort of just this intuition coming from somewhere within you but you know, was, was it, was it, were you not sure whether to trust it or was it, you just knew somewhere in your heart that, you know, I just have to make this my, my path. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't the first time that I'd used my sort of intuitive knowing to direct my life. I think probably to the frustration of quite a lot of people in my life. That's always <laughs> been my principal route. Like if something feels right, then I'll do it or make it happen. Um, you know, there's other times of course, where I've heard intuitions and ignored them completely for a long time to my detriment. And, you know, I've lived both sides of that, but this one just, you know, it was like a gong going off. It was like, you know, just that sort of resounding truth of, oh, wow. You know, so you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, that's so brave of you. I always say it was sort of, there was no, nothing brave about it. It was just true. And once mm. truth emerges inside you like that, there's, there's no point questioning it because you, you, know, you can't paper over that in any way. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just followed along and um, I'm glad I did, but you know, it's also not, not the easiest of, of paths. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I mean, meditation, mindfulness, they, they, they have many benefits, obviously, in our physical and our mental health. But I wanted to ask you then personally, why are you so passionate about it? What is it that mindfulness enables for people that, you know, drives you to get out there and share it with others? Yeah, well, I think um, one of the things that I noticed in my professional career was that there was... Um, you know, there was a pr proliferation of people who were brilliant at navigating their external reality and doing their job really, really well. But I didn't see many role models where that external excellence was matched by my sense. And obviously, 
you don't know another's inner world, but my sense of their inner kind of excellence. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me that this was a quite important gap in uh, human functioning. Um, and that if you've got a lot of people expressing a lot of sort of cleverness and excellence in the world, but without being fully connected to themselves and living from a state of harmony, that sort of as within, so without type of idea, um, then I think that leads to a lot of dead ends for people. You know, I do a lot of coaching with people these days and, and often with quite senior executives and leaders and um you know one of the reflections that people often have is that the success that they've had doesn't doesn't give them everything that they thought or hoped it might um you know unless done consciously and as a sort of um ingredient of a life um you know as a sort of methodology for opening more into awareness of self self knowledge um and you know there's um there's that link that i found really interesting like how could we develop a new model whereby we could help people um match up their outer excellence with inner excellence and i certainly wasn't socialized or educated with any of the skills to get myself there. It just so happened that I, you know, come across um, meditation and yoga and Reiki, and I've done all sorts of weird and wonderful things, um, you know, along the way as well, courses and workshops and got all sorts of bananas sounding qualifications <laughs> as a result. Um, but um, part of what I had learned was um, that this kind of inner reality is mappable, you know, on a personal level, there are ways of looking around the inner world of thoughts, emotions, and sensations, which do enable us to make more sense of um, our experience and feel more centered, stable, calm, and grounded in the world. And one of the outcomes of that is to feel like we can um, relate to our lived experience with more of the things that we want, which tend to be purpose and joy and happiness and alignment and, um, you know, having uh, relationships with people also resonate on those levels. Um, that this kind of internal navel gazing, as people sometimes call it, is actually, it's very purposeful and useful. Um, and certainly in the, you know, the framework that my teacher uses, the, the degree to which we're able to do this for ourselves is really a gift to each other and the people around us because we end up um, being more capable of being generative in the present moment rather than being a victim of the present moment and therefore needing the attention um, of others. And of course, that doesn't mean we don't draw on the network and, um, you know, take, take our place in community in the normal way, but um, it's this sort of self-care, which actually is, um, even though I thought you know, to start with it was a quite a selfish thing to do, it's actually a real gift to others. Um, so, you know, I sort of learned that through my, my journey. And then my job is, is kind of inviting people into whatever aspect of that feels relevant or useful or fun for them. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a really beautiful way of looking at it. That it's not just you know in something in service of yourself, but it is something that's in in service of others, isn't it? And it's what creates harmonious communities, work work environments, and and everything. Um, yeah. yeah, I like that. It's sort of you're seeing that there's this that that there's this missing link, right? That people need to sort of make a bit of a mindset shift. That you know, it's not all about what you get out there, you know, about the position you end up in, in work and how big your car is outside and what color it is and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. it's more about what you bring to the world, isn't it? And um, those qualities that you can bring that, that joy and well being comes from within, doesn't it? Not from having those things. Yeah. Um, I think I saw on, I'm not sure where I saw it, somewhere on your website, you, you um, talk about these three gifts of mindfulness. I wonder if you 
could tell us about those? I probably won't say the same ones because I'm always changing yeah. my mind about them, but I can certainly only talk about three. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, so I think probably the, the first one is this idea of internal mapping of our inner experience. Um, I think that's so useful, you know, just to have a bit more knowledge what to do when we bump into our negative thought patterns, um, when we bump into um, emotions that feel clunky or difficult, um, when we bump into painful sensations or unpleasant sensations in the body, um, to, you know, to have some of the skills of mindfulness behind us, um, it really makes a huge difference in the lived experience of those moments. Um, and, you know, we have to remember, even though our kind of um, lived experience appears to be a sort of physical one, everything is actually happening in this world of your primary environment of consciousness which is showing up for us in these thoughts, emotions, and sensations. Um, so, you know, whether we're on a roller coaster or receiving a scary email from our boss, it's going to be our own you know, primary reality that we're in contact with and navigating through. Um, and so I think just, you know, the, the basics of, of learning how to navigate those is, is so important. Um, I guess it gives us somewhere to turn to, doesn't it, in those moments um, when, you know, we, we don't know what to do and how to navigate sort of those those moments of anxiety or worry or, or anger or whatever it is. We sort of, we see the external world and think that that's the primary cause and that's the way that we experience the, the problem. But I guess having that sort of awareness of thoughts and emotions gives us somewhere to turn in those moments, doesn't it? I think so. And also for me, it's that kind of... Um, knowledge of the well of stillness or center centeredness within that can become a place of not just refuge but resource it's it's somewhere that we can actually turn to um and and find the warmth of our own awareness in that space being enough to get us through almost anything i mean the yeah. phrase that always comes to me is one of jack cornfield's um which is that you know at a certain point you have to just trust that the heart can hold it all and he's just got such a lovely way of saying that, yeah. that you kind of like oh your heart opens and you like oh wow yeah that that also feels true um and there is that sense of actually yeah the human heart can can hold it all and we don't know that but we can trust that it's true um, yeah. Well, it's been true for us in the past, hasn't it? We, you know, we think of all the things we've been through and we somehow got through the other end, even though we didn't think we would, you yeah. know, there's that inner strength there. We don't realize we have the capacity yeah. to, to deal with these things. Yeah. Your track record for getting through tough days is 100%. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll also get through this one. Yeah. So I kind of like, I like that as well. So, you know, finding, I sort of call it this paradigm of being powerfully peaceful. Um, and um, yeah, there's something I think that, you know, peacefulness has almost been jettisoned as being too passive, but actually there's a real potency in peacefulness um, because it, you know, it comes with perspective and presence um, and, you know, the third gift of mindfulness that I would sort of mention is, is its link with creativity you know, the sort of higher purpose i think of, of my business is to inspire conscious creativity um because i think that of everything that's needed in the world i think that's what we need i think actually human beings have everything they need to solve their problems in harmonic ways if they look to the right parts of themselves for those answers um, so yeah, that link between the field of mindfulness and the field of creativity is also something that I enjoy kind of pointing people towards. And, um, you know, I think it's something that when 
when we can feel that and experience that, that sort of bubbling well of, well, this is kind of the arising of life occurring within. Um, it's a real gift because then you're like, okay, well, this is, this is somewhere I can come back to you know, when I'm struggling. This is a really useful place to hang out and check in with. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if they had any correlation to what's on the website. But <laughs> today, those are my gifts of my importance. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and that, that third one, yeah, it's like, it's instantly practical, isn't it? And, and experiential people can use that, you know, straight away that, and yeah, it's true that from when the mind is peaceful, when it's calm, that's where you have access to, to your best problem solving skills, your creativity. Um, when you're sort of wound up and stressed and don't even realize it, you you know, your mind's filtering the information that's coming in, isn't it? And you don't really have access to the, the kind of tools you need to yeah. navigate life. So yeah, that's really powerful. One of the things I like to kind of sort of pose as a challenge, I think the challenge of our time is kind of we have to um, see if we can overcome our intelligence and become wise at this point in our, in our human history. Um, and I think that kind of access to wisdom um, comes, comes through um, looking through the body and heart towards the mind rather than just going straight to our mind and you know, we tend to be quite clever if we just think about stuff but we're not always wise not always thinking in a harmonic connected way um, but i think these practices of embodiment that are gaining in popularity um, are really helping us to show up with more of our resources online yeah i think that it's a nice way to segue actually into the unconscious living part. So, sure. um, so many of us, I think are living our lives unconsciously, you know, dealing with the day-to-day -day worries and issues. Um, you know, before we're even out of bed, our minds are just all over the place. Aren't they? The, our awareness is already chasing after the things we need to do, the deadlines that are coming up, the things we need to organize or going over and over what's happened in the past, our resentments, our traumas. And so I think for many very rarely we find that the, our awareness, our mind and our body are in sync, fully present with, you know, the activity at hand. Yet it's incredibly peaceful um, and powerful to be fully present, isn't it? You know, when people are fully immersed in an activity, whether it's art, music, study uh, or some hobby, there's, it's very peaceful, it's very calm. There's an inner well-being and joy that, that comes from being fully immersed in something. It's almost like a, a pandemic of the mind, this unconscious living, isn't it? Um, and I think it's something that I've seen you're passionate about raising awareness of too, right? Yeah, although um, the one thing that I'd say about this is um, you know, sometimes people use this idea of whether they're conscious or unconscious as a sort of another thing to feel guilty about or to kind of um, to worry about. And yeah. You know, consciousness in the in the sort of way that I would talk about it um, in this context is really all about bringing increased heartful awareness towards our intentional living. We could all be more conscious at any given moment. Um, we could all be less conscious at any given where it's a you know it's a question of degree. Um, and I think the place to start for most people is that we're doing the best we can right now. Um, and the best way of thinking about it is, you know, is there some sort of direction of travel that I would like to, you know, I'd, okay, I'd like to spend more of my day connected to activities that I love in the presence of people that I enjoy um, doing doing things that feel aligned with who I am. You know, maybe that's the direction of travel. But then the nitty gritty of, you know, the rubber hitting the road um, and getting into the lived experience of, of you know, domestic life that most of us are involved with, you know, really gnarly experiences of, of life and work and, you know, not to mention all of the, the slew of circumstances that comes our way. 
So I think it's really important to sort of start with an acknowledgement of I'm actually doing pr pretty well here. <laughs> kind of just <laughs> getting through this is actually you know pretty decent. Um, and yes, maybe we would like to have this kind of direction of travel and we can sort of emerge into that. But I think coming from the the space of self compassion, starting where we are, knowing that there isn't really a completion point to this, um, is is a is a good way in from my perspective. It's a really really good way of looking at it. Um, and I'd, I'd like to pick up on something you mentioned there at the start that um, that it was about sort of the, this um, heartfelt awareness of you know what what's meaningful for us, right? What our what our aspirations are, what what we see as as being um, a good life, and that's I guess a, a way that we can access um, or, or bring awareness to our day to day life. My um, my teacher's coined this this term of um, co native intelligence of sort of you know being um, aware of all the choices that we make in our day, um, not just on sort of like the quick wins. Um, you know, like the, oh, I'll watch a box set on Netflix instead of doing something, um, or I'll eat this tub of ice cream sort of for, for a quick win. But actually sort of um, if we're really aware of our aspirations and really aware of what what's a meaningful life for us, um, not that Netflix isn't meaningful or, or ice cream, but uh, we can sort of, with an awareness of that, then our daily choices can be influenced by that, right? We can bring mindfulness into that. So knowing, you know, is this activity or is is what you know this decision i'm making in my life going to lead to my own well-being or the well-being of others or is it actually going to bring me more stress later on more more heartache later on um you know uh, self-criticism for eating all that ice cream or whatever it is um so i think yeah that that aspiration part is really important isn't it a lot of the people that i work with um they don't have any trouble being aspirational or ambitious <laughs> Like they true, true. got that in spades. What they what they often need help with from me is kind of the the rationale and reasoning and tools to bring more self compassion into their lived out experience of that, um, and sometimes a bit of help with um, the questions and reflections to make sure that their direction of travel is actually pointing them where they want to go. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the paradigm of life is, is not one, um, it's not like a journey based type thing that we talk about you know, life as a journey. It's not, it's not a journey in the respect of trying to get to some sort of destination because it's essentially death in, in this version. Um, but the paradigm of life is much better kind of correlated to something like a piece of music actually the point of the piece of music is to listen and to dance and to kind of flow along with the thing and be joyful of that. Um, it's, it's that sort of now moment experience of it. That is a paradigm that actually that life is all about. And so, you know, I try and point people towards creating within their now, you know, the sort of piece of music that they want to dance to rather than it emerging at the you know, very end when they might be like, oh, wait, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're here. <laughs> we're here. Ah, okay, we're here. Um, so, yeah, kind of, I think just kind of making sure um, that what's showing up in our current reality is something that we're really curating in a sense of the, this is it this is, this is it. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that can sometimes help us with our direction of travel, but also our orientation to the now. Yeah. I really, I, I love that analogy of it, of the being like a piece of music. Um, I think when, when I talk about aspiration or, or, you know, what makes a meaningful life, that's the sort of thing that I'm gearing towards rather than sort of, you know, I want to have, 10 million at, you know, by the time I'm 50 or whatever it is. Um, but more about, you know, what for, for your day-to-day -day experience, what is a meaningful life for you? What, you know, what, um, would mean that when you got to the end of your life, you could say, yeah, that was a, a life well lived. That wasn't, you know, something that I wasted, you know, the first 20 worrying the second, you know, 20, uh, doing this and that, but actually, you know, yeah, I made the most of my, my daily experience. Um, and like you said, that's a segue into trying to be more present centered, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
what do you think are the the benefits of sort of living with more awareness of our sort of day-to-day activities what does that you know look like to you it's just more fun like in a very simple way it's much more fun um you know if i think back to when i was a barrister ticked a lot of boxes um and um you know, from a sort of outside looking in perspective, people would think, oh, well, that, you know, he's doing really well. That's like, he's nailing life. But on my sort of internal side of it, there was this misalignment uh, between who I was and what I was doing. It wasn't that I couldn't do it, just wasn't making my heart sing. Um, and so it took quite a whole scale reworking um, of my life for, for it to, um you know line up in this sort of sense of of feeling aligned between who i am and and what i do in the world um so you know just keeping an eye on that i think and you know your your body will tell you your emotions will tell you your think thought patterns will tell you you know when i was in my last months of of being a barrister when i knew i wasn't meant to be there anymore but i was just wrapping up my practice you know i had all sorts of slightly odd kind of symptoms. It felt like my hair was being pushed out of my scalp. Um, uh, you know, I have a lot of tension in my body, all sorts of things. You, you know, you could actually look back and be like, Oh, well, this is, this is not supreme functioning (laughs) for Neil. Uh, (laughs) uh, And then gradually as I sort of moved into my new work, like, and of course there's moments of stress and issues and all sorts of things. It's different, but, um, that sort of deep sense of who I am and what I'm doing being lined up just means that I kind of do it anyway. Um, and yeah, there's a sense of comparison being maybe not gone, but much reduced. Like when, um, when you're really aligned in, in your, your work or your activities or your, um, lifestyle, um, it's like, well, nobody can really sell you a better version of that. Um, and, and so that's, that's a really, I think, powerful place to, to move towards. This um, concept then of, uh, you know, your business, the conscious professional, um, uh, this, uh, you know, idea of conscious leadership, conscious work environments, could you unpack that a little bit for us? You know, why did you just, side that that was an area you wanted to focus on specifically i know it sort of came up um in a meditation but what, what do you think it was that sort of yeah pushed you in that direction yeah i don't I, hmm, I don't know if i know the answer to that um i guess it was there was the professional side of me and there was the esoteric sort of side of me if i could put it you know, generally in those sort of boxes. Um, and I think as a result of walking both of those paths simultaneously for a while, I had sort of unwittingly become an access point between those worlds. Um, and so I was able to stand in a room full of lawyers or um, you know, accountants or scary bankers or, you know, whatever sort of very... <laughs> type of, of people and be like, this is something you should really think about. Um, and this is what it could potentially help you with. And why don't we have a go at it right now? Um, and so... And they wouldn't think you were a hippie just coming in because you had your, yeah, that background. Exactly, because I kind of looked like them and sounded like them. And um, so, yeah, I, it, it was almost like, well, that was the serendipity of that moment. Um, that those slightly, you know, the sort of fracturing of me when I was able to heal myself and bring those worlds together and take ownership of all of it, um, it kind of catalyzed this potential to welcome people kind of hand out in either direction um, and welcome people towards practices that they might otherwise have, you know, never engaged with. So, you know, I think probably... A significant number, you know, certainly in the hundreds, possibly thousands of people, they've led their first meditation at work um, or ever. And that's a real honor, I think, to 
shepherd people in 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 that way um and to offer that type of experience um and so whether it's centered around the language of it's important but it's all the same thing to me so whether we're talking about mindfulness or resilience or well-being or awareness you know essentially my job is helping people feel a bit more capable and safer um navigating their inner world and bringing that into into expression through their being and doing um so for me it's 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 kind of simple but then you know we have to package it in certain ways and um yeah. make it acceptable and relevant and all of those things which is you know is also that's a fun part of it as well yeah, it seems like you're you're in a, the unique position um, to to be that person. I really like that idea of that sort of everything fractured, but then it came all together again. These two sides of you, um, which were always meant to sort of be together, they were just together in the wrong way with this sort of you know dual business card of healing and then a yeah. lawyer, and, uh, and then they come together in this kind of natural way. Yeah. yeah. Um, now I wanted to ask you the the big question I'm asking everyone on the podcast, um, and that is if you had sort of a few minutes to talk to every single person in the world, so you um, you had the attention of everyone in the world and you could tell them just one thing, sort of your top tip um, that you've learned that you think would change their life, what would it be? So I'll have to borrow from Rumi here, um, but it's my favorite quote, which is to live life as if everything is rigged in your favor. Um, and I think it's a really powerful short set of words um, because as a spiritual practice, it's pretty heavy duty. It's quite a simple sentence. But if you actually think about, you know, orienting towards all of the circumstances that show up, which we, you know, as human beings, we quite like to put things in the yes box or the no thank you box and then get into all sorts of different habits and patterns around resisting stuff and trying to latch onto this stuff and shove that under the carpet or yeah. whatever. But if we can remember to live life as if everything is being delivered for us, um, then I think it can, it can really change things and, and, and it's work, it's work kind of um, trying that on and, and practicing with it. But yeah, that's my, that's that's all I've got for a, a mini tip bit. I like it. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and such an interesting conversation. I think um, before we go into the the meditation that you're very kindly going to offer us, um, lastly, where could people find more about you, your website, and your book? Thank you. Yeah. So. Um... The corporate side of the business is the consciousprofessional.com. Um, and then the my personal website is just my name, neilseligman.com, um, where you can find information about the books and events and retreats and um, my Facebook group as well. Um, it's the Conscious Professional Mindful Community on Facebook. Um, so I lead a, a guided meditation um, each week in there for members. So yeah, uh, people will be very welcome to to come join us in, in there if they so wish. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. <laughs> I wanted to thank you for listening to this week's podcast and I hope it brings some benefit to you. If you would like to learn more about meditation or join us for our free weekly online meditation sessions, then please join our Samadhi community on Facebook. Just go to our website, samadhi.org.uk, click on support, then click on join our Samadhi Sangha and you can find out all the information there. Please don't forget to subscribe and share and I hope to see you again soon.